I uh, am co-author of a manifesto called Big Potatoes, which is the, the um, ambitiously named London Manifesto for Innovation. Uh, and we have uh, been researching and trying to understand what's going on in the UK and globally around innovation in the context of the recession and beyond. And the talk that I'm going to be doing today is about one aspect of urbanism, which is transport. And uh, that may sound slightly esoteric, but I guess you wouldn't be here today without some form of transport. Cities wouldn't exist if transport didn't exist. Um, the richness of ideas and uh, experiences and uh, things which come into cities, which we experience and so on, wouldn't exist without transport. And transport's really been fundamental to the culture of cities. Um, now, some people maybe, well, it'd be interesting to ask actually who here works in any area of urbanism or architecture or the design of space. Does anyone admit to such activities? One person here. Um, in some ways, transport seems like a slightly uh, mundane subject. On the other hand, the innovations in transport that have come about through the creative application of technology have been tremendous and I'm going to talk about some of those today uh, in four different contexts and I'm really going to talk about what I call creative technology which is a combination of engineering and design I didn't realize these slides were forwarding themselves it's a bit like a pachachka isn't it really um, so that's going to be an interesting challenge um, that uh, allow us to innovate effectively and create what transport should do, which is, from my, our point of view, to create better, uh, allow people to get around faster, more comfortably, more safely, more cheaply, perhaps more sociably as well, uh, and to uh, continue to improve to doing that. And I think one of the major challenges we have in transport today, as I hope I'll outline, is that often for the lack of creativity, um, problem solving, uh, investment in research and development, adversity to risk, uh, unwillingness to encounter failure, uh, and I think actually a slight anti-humanism in the way in which transport policy is devised, we actually aren't making progress and often are actually going backwards, although I'd be interested to have a challenge from anybody who thinks that we're, uh, what I think is going backwards is actually going forwards. And can I just actually check, everyone can hear me at the back because I'm not using a mic. Can you hear okay? Thank you. Okay, excellent. Okay, so I'm going to talk around four themes as a way of trying to understand what, where innovation is taking place in transport and where innovation is needed and where the problems are. Um, and the first area I'm going to talk about is vehicles and how you, how you get from one place to another. Uh, and vehicles broadly break down into road vehicles, rail vehicles, air and space vehicles. It sounds slightly uh, 1960s in a way, but we do still go into space and as you'll see we're doing it more and more, thankfully. So the first area is, is road vehicles and uh, clearly the electric car is, uh, well, I say it's the thing of the moment, if you listen to the Today programme this morning, it's been the thing to come for the last 20 or perhaps even 30 years. Um, this is an example of a Renault uh, electric car uh, at a car show. Um, and some people may have driven in a Prius or various of the other uh, iterations of, uh, of electric car that, uh, uh, that exist. But clearly there are interesting challenges, I think, for creatives in a way of helping people to think about new ways to use cars that will adapt to the short battery lives and the short ranges they have. But also to think about whether reinventing the car in its existing form and just putting a different power unit in is the way to go forward. Um, do we need some kind of different form of transport? Some people might think we need less transport. Some people might think we can use information and communication technology to replace transport. And I think those are interesting discussions to have and I'm keen to encourage a, a problem-solving attitude to these things. Uh, this is the Tata Nano. Uh, Nano you'll know from your Greek, uh, Mini, uh, produced by Tata, who, uh, as you probably also know, own Jaguar Land Rover in this country and a big Indian conglomerate. And this is a car for the masses of India. India, unevenly, but uh, nevertheless is a growing country economically. Uh, it's becoming a country which, where people can afford to go from bicycles to motorbikes to cars. 
and the Nano I think is a major innovation in design terms. It's kind of what Alex Isagonis did with the British Motor Corporation in the 60s with the Mini uh, in actually helping us to enable everybody to have access to modern transport, modern, safe, fast, comfortable transport. Now, a lot of people think, well, if everybody in the world drove, then the planet would, you know, breathe its last breath. And I think that's an interesting discussion to have. How much transport do we want? Uh, how can we think creatively about how to address the problems that any greater use of technology will tend to bring, even if those problems are less than the original problem they're solving? This is kind of the other end of the spectrum of an electric car from the one that I showed you. Does anyone recognize this? I bet none of you own one. It's a Tesla, uh, which is uh, created by a company based in California, founded by Elon Musk, about who you'll hear more later. And Musk has addressed the issue of electric cars and people's wariness of them. Slow, small, can't go very fast, unsafe perhaps, by creating a performance sports car, which sells for many hundreds of thousands of dollars, but to show that electric cars can perform as well or as better as pe petrol engine and diesel cars. And I think that's an interesting design solution, an interesting way of thinking about the psychology of cars and how people might adopt them. And as you can see, it's parked in an electric car bay here. This is, uh, I, I'm going to talk now about rail and uh, the future of rail, and in a way, rail, at least in the UK, has gone through more convulsions in the last 30 years than uh, car transport. Uh, and another way, it's made less progress than it made in the previous 150 years or so. But one example of progress is HS2, which if we sit here long enough, will probably plow somewhere within 100 yards of this building on its way up to the West Midlands. And HS2, following HS1, the high-speed train that goes down through Kent to Dover and so on, is an interesting innovation in the sense that it's trying to increase the speed at which we travel to somewhere. But I think there's an interesting creative challenge in we may be able to knock 30 minutes off the journey to Birmingham, but if we're stuck for 30 minutes on the Euston Road getting there, then we haven't saved any time. And how can we create more joined up ways of traveling? Something I'm going to talk about in the context of Singapore later on. Um, this is, in fact, the Mercury train. It's a concept train designed by Priestman Good, who are a London-based product design company. And it's actually been used in a lot of the uh, journalism about HS2 and even some of the government's press releases, because they haven't designed a train for it yet. So Priestman Good's rather fabulous looking train, which you'll see on the inside uh, is even more interesting, uh, has stood in for that. Uh, and what Priestman Good are trying to do, uh, thinking about the design of train interiors, is try and make trains as attractive to use as aeroplanes, not Ryanair, but, you know, slightly more classy operations, or more expensive as well. Um, and uh, this is the, the second class, uh, is to the, at the bottom right, which is trying to facilitate on-board working. Uh, the first class is much more airline-like, much more relaxed and leisurely, more like a sort of private jet in some ways. Uh, but it, this country seems to be, well, not unique, but unusual in actually not adapting trains for working use to any great degree. You might get power occasionally, you might get Wi-Fi on some services and so on. If you go to Sweden, the trains are really adapted beautifully for working. They're actually designed like offices, at least the bits that are supposed to be like offices. So I think that, that kind of creative thinking is really interesting in helping to change our experience and, and desire to travel. Um, but nevertheless, it's still a train. A train is a concept which is 150, 170 years old. It's 1830 since the Rainhill trials uh, in Liverpool. Uh, and do we need to be thinking about different kinds of transport? Well, I'm going to come on to that later on. This is almost as old as the train, the tram, that used to run through Camden, Islington, central London and so on, and were phased out, uh, at least in London, in the 50s. Uh, they've been reinstated in Manchester with considerable success. Um, in London with less success in Croydon, Wimbledon. And, you know, to be honest, it's a very good service. Uh, it's well designed, it's well thought out, it's an intelligent bit of design, but it's still a form of transport that our great-grandparents would be familiar with. You know, they may not have, you know, electronic tickets, but they would be familiar with the concept otherwise. So, you know, it's a kind of conservative form of transport, and I think it's another area that we need to be thinking about more creatively. All right, so we've gone across the land. I'm now going to talk about the air. 
And as I say, in a way, the great age of flight is behind us. Uh, does anyone recognize these two planes? Anyone old enough to? So on the left is the Chupolov Tu-144, which was a Soviet version of Concorde, at least according to the British, uh, British media. Uh, and on the right is Concorde. These are at a museum in Germany. So this was supersonic Mach 2.25 travel in a museum. We're going to come on to that in a minute. So a bit more people may say it was very fuel inefficient. It was only for the super rich. You know, who needs to get to Washington in four hours when you can get there in six hours? and so on. But nevertheless, it represented a kind of ambition and a kind of risk-taking and a kind of investment in research and development that we don't really see in aerospace, at least public aerospace these days. And I think those are the kind of ambitions in transport that if we're going to make the most of it, if we're going to apply our creative skills effectively, we need to take more advantage of. Uh, there's a Concorde at uh, RAF Dux well, at Duxford Imperial War Museum. There's one in the Seattle Air and Space Museum. That's the only place you're going to see a Concorde these days, sadly. And I commented on BBC News about its last flight, which was a rather tragic event. But anyway, we're going to keep it upbeat. We're going to talk about EasyJet. Who's not flown on EasyJet? One person, OK. <laughs> One person prepared to put their hand up, at least. Uh, EasyJet Ryanair is a kind of controversial subject, in a way. You know, people say, you know, we can't afford the air flight, look at the impact it's having on the environment, uh, look at the impact it has on all those little Baltic countries where people go on stag do's and behave terribly in the way that we're very embarrassed about. You know, where, you know, we're going on all the beaches that only the really rich people used to be able to afford to get to in Spain and, you know, France and so on. But I mean, from my point of view, EasyJet, not through innovation, to be fair, but through using resources more efficiently, you know, kicking its workers around a bit, to be honest, um, treating us a bit more like cattle, uh, you know, not trying to upsell us, well, actually trying to upsell us everything from luggage allowances to food and so on, has very cleverly re-engineered the business model of airlines such that it's bigger now than British Airways. Ryanair is bigger still than EasyJet. So I think it's, uh, you know, it's an interesting service design concept. You know, EasyJet is a pretty good service design experience for the cost of it. And I think that creative input has made this something which is available to the masses. And, and from my point of view, that's a good thing. Um, you know, it's allowed people to get together who live in different countries. It's allowed people to experience the world more. So it's not a huge innovation. It's still a pretty standard Boeing aircraft, um, but uh, it represents progress in some respects. Now, aircraft interiors have changed quite a bit in some ways and not a lot in other ways. Generally, the seats get closer together. Um, you know, the seats' designs don't change to allow you more legroom and so on. But this is another project by Priestman Good. I don't actually take a fee for presenting their work, but I thought this was interesting, partly because it's an unusual take on an aircraft interior. It's a concept project, uh, which is looking at the challenge of people who use wheelchairs and how they get on and off aircraft. And they point out that able-bodied people who fly aren't aware that an hour or more before every flight there's big burly porters wrangling people in wheelchairs up rickety stairs onto planes not designed for wheelchairs. And Priestman Good took this challenge and said how can we design a wheelchair where somebody can be moved to that chair in the airport where there's more space to move around and can then be maneuvered onto the aircraft in a chair which then fits in and slots in so it's got all the safety requirements it can deal with a 3G crash, that's not when your phone dies, that's 3Gs of gravity. Um, you know, like going into space, really. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing, and a comfortable thing, and the kind of thing that you know, people who have to use wheelchairs deserve, unlike the NHS issue that most people have. So I think this is an innovation, creative innovation, in thinking about how to re-engineer the interior of an aircraft. And actually, it's the kind of thing probably ordinary people would want to sit on, because it's perfectly comfortable and much more flexible. It turns round to the side to allow easy access. OK, so from the prosaic but important to the truly revolutionary, and this is where real R&D, real application and real ambition uh, takes off, so to speak. Skylon, named, I'm not sure even after the rather wonderful uh, feature at the uh, Festival of Britain site on the South Bank. People right remember the Skylon? Well, not personally, obviously, but... Um, Skylon is a revolutionary kind of uh, propulsion 
which combines a jet engine and a rocket engine. And people who know anything about aeronautical engineering, which I won't count an awful lot of people here in automatically, a jet engine works on air being compressed into an engine and combined with fuel and uh, uh, generate, you know, driving a turbine which drives the aircraft. Whereas a rocket, uh, oxygen, liquid oxygen and fuel are combined and explode and propel the aircraft through the, through the, the rocket, through an explosion. And the Sabre engine, which is designed by a British company, uh, is able to uh, combine uh, rocket type propulsion uh, within the atmosphere and outside the atmosphere, which is a really creative leap to make to combine those two engines. Now sadly, although it's been validated by the European Union, money has been spent on it by the UK government, it's not being invested in. And this is a revolutionary technology in the sense that it could get you to Australia or New Zealand or any South Pacific island that had space to land it uh, in four hours. It could get you into space and back again and you could reuse the aircraft and in a much more practical way than the space shuttle which if you remember has to be launched off the back of a fat 747 and uh, you know is 1960s technology. So this is a really interesting innovation. I won't expect anyone to understand this diagram because I can't say I entirely understand it myself but this is the reaction engines Sabre engine uh, and you, if anyone familiar with, with engines will see some elements of a jet engine, some elements of a rocket engine there. So that's the kind of thing we ought to be taking risks on, we ought to be investing more in R&D on, we ought to be more ambitious about employing because it's tremendously exciting. And you might not want to go to Australia, lots of people do, lots of people from Australia want to come here, in fact most of them seem to be here, some even in this audience perhaps. I'm a Kiwi so you know, no, no offence as my son says. Okay, so a little bit of back to the future, we're going into space now. now the Sabre and Skylon obviously go into space. This is like dedicated 1960s space, you can see from the Dan Dare type uh, illustration. This is BAE Systems Mustard, isn't it great? A multi-use space transport and recovery device. So it's kind of like the space shuttle before the space shuttle. Super clever little bit of lateral thinking and problem solving. Because when you want to get a rocket into space, you have to put so much fuel in there, as you'll know from watching all those Apollo uh, launches. You have to have these huge booster tanks which drop off you know when you're only about a mile up in the air and they are wasted essentially can't be reused. This is three uh, rockets combined all of which can be reused and two of them drop off uh, at the point at which the sufficient velocity to escape the atmosphere and the third module then delivers the satellites or human or whatever into space and can then return in a space shuttle kind of manner. So this is BAE Systems, I don't know what they were called then, British Aerospace probably. Uh, never got built but it was a truly uh, creative leap to think of this kind of solution. Not even sure it would have worked but we should have taken the risk on trying it out and we should have been prepared to fail which we're, we're too unwilling to do these days. So we're going to come back a bit more into the present now. Um, has anybody heard of SpaceX? It's not a sci-fi film, oh, four or five people. Um, another company started by Elon Musk who made his money in a company called uh, Zip2 and then PayPal, somebody may have used PayPal once upon a time here, uh, sold to eBay for large wadges of money which is now doing very good things, sorry. Um, as a private company uh, putting satellites and other payloads into space and this is the first time that a private company has been able to do that for the US government and been able to put a rocket into space, deliver a payload and bring it back again. Uh, and that indicates that space technology has come down in price, become more reliable, improved since the 1960s and the 1970s, since the heyday of the space race, moon landings and uh, Star Wars and all those kind of things. Um, so this is a really significant development. It's prosaic in the sense that there's nothing particularly revolutionary about the technology, but Musk has designed a business which is making a profit now and putting things into space for people. And that means we get our GPS, we get our satellite television, we get our security, it means the NSA can snoop on us, all those good things. Did no one get that joke? <laughs> all right, never mind, it was a really rubbish joke. Um, 
So we're going to hear one, one more thing about Elon Musk shortly, but he's younger than I am, better looking and much richer and more ambitious. Um, Richard Branson, bearded, older than me, mm, maybe better looking, certainly more ambitious, um, has been designing with many other very clever people, Virgin Galactic, probably you've seen this in the news, trying to in a recreational way put people into space. You might think it's a bit trivial, but it's pretty exciting the idea of being able to go into space from a spaceport in a desert somewhere. And I think this is a really interesting project, partly because it's private, partly because of its ambition, partly because they've had to design the entire infrastructure of civilian space flight. And in the past it's only been astronauts, uh, you know, people who are essentially military uh, and aeronautical people who were put into space before. But now, if you've got £200,000, it could be you. And how do you design... It's like having Heathrow in 1945. How do you design the experience of going into space and everything that goes with it? All the safety issues, all the experience issues, uh, all the preparation issues, and so on. Uh, and I think uh, they haven't yet launched a commercial flight, but this is one of the most exciting projects going on alongside SpaceX. So... That's uh, land, well we haven't done much on sea actually, not been a whole lot of innovation in sea transport, certainly not for passengers, there's been a lot for, for containers, um, and we've done space. And now I want to talk about the ways in which these vehicles get from one place to another. So routes and platforms. And some of the things I'm going to talk about are things which are actually, at one level, they're kind of vehicles, but another level I think they're so radical, they're kind of new platforms or new routes. And by a platform I mean something that other things can be built around, something which is a, 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 a qualitative change. This is not a platform or revolution, this is the congestion charge, um, which is very clever in the way it's designed. It's a brilliant bit of uh, thinking to connect together all these services in a way which basically works quite well. But what it works well to do is to collect taxes from us, I'm not against taxes in any way, but I am when all it does is redistribute the misery of travelling by car in London. And I wrote a long article about this uh, uh, when it was launched and looked at a lot of the dynamics around it and, and essentially it's not an innovation, it's simply, uh, uh, in fact it was designed in a way almost to inhibit innovations in travel. For instance, uh, car sharing clubs and taxis, no, car sharing clubs still had to pay the congestion charge even though they represented a way in which people might use fewer vehicles and so on. But anyway, we've kind of accepted it in one way or another. They did kick it out of West London, which was good. This is more of an innovation, the urban light transit system at Heathrow Terminal 5. Now, Terminal 5 got terrible shtick for its baggage handling at the time it opened, um, but this was one of the real innovations, which is computer-controlled, uh, autonomous vehicles which come every 12 seconds to pick up people and take them from one part of the terminal to another. Has anyone actually been on it? I'm ashamed to say I've never yet got to Terminal 5. Um, but this is the kind of intelligent use of information technology which is allowing new forms of transport and new platforms. You know, uh, very safe, we're going to come on in a minute to talk about uh, driverless cars as well. Um, this is Google's self-driving car project, which being a Google project has got a tremendous amount of press, but actually when you look at it, it does seem like it actually holds water. Obviously not the car, but the concept. Uh, and it's driven for hundreds of thousands of miles in the US, uh, albeit the roads are a bit easier to drive on there. Um, had no accidents except when a human has been controlling the car manually. Uh, and you can see some of the control systems there uh, it's been licensed to use in Nevada, so you have to have someone able to drive it, even if they're not driving it, and maybe licensed by Jerry Brown, the governor of California, soon. And I think there are really interesting affordances, if you like, of this kind of thing, if we think creatively around it. So one could have a car which took you to work, dropped you off and went and picked up your partner and took them to work, or took, you know, went and picked up your kids, uh, allows for much more efficient use of resources, uh, it can park better than we can, or certainly better than I can, um, because it's got sensors and it can use uh, its motors effectively and so on. So I think there's a lot of really interesting possibilities here. It's not reinventing the car, but it's going further, I think, than some of the examples I've given, particularly around rail and light rail. 
Uh, this is a kind of different kind of um, platform. This should really actually be in the rail section, um, but it represents a really ambitious um, rail project. It's controversial uh, because it's going from uh, China into Tibet, which obviously is, uh, you know, occupied uh, in a not entirely uh, internationally agreed way by China. But that, if you put that aside for a minute, the uh, Chinese state built a railway that's over a thousand miles long through some of the most difficult, hostile terrain in the world. And you can see that's not exactly Sussex, if you know what I mean. Um, uh, elevated railway, very cold conditions, snow, ice, uh, mountainous, etc. And built a railway which is like, capable of taking modern trains uh, to Tibet from China and back again. And I think that's a huge achievement and a kind of ambition which we kind of lack in this country now. Not that we want to occupy Tibet, all right, but we do want to get from here to Edinburgh or Newcastle or Birmingham or Brighton more quickly than we do, or at least aspire to do that. And I think this represents that kind of aspiration. Now, China is a very different country from the UK, but I don't think that means we can't have the level of aspiration the Chinese often show. Now, this is a kind of different level of aspiration for a, a kind of platform. This is the last Elon Musk project, which I will be not paid for promoting, which is called Hyperloop. How many people got caught in the hype around Hyperloop in the last few weeks? A couple of people, four or five people, maybe more. So this is a concept which is entirely not new, but partly because Musk is a very celebrated entrepreneur, partly because he uh, has managed to package this in a, a novel way. He's essentially combined a magnetic levitation train, which is 1970s technology in a way, actually really only used commercially in China, uh, with a concept of putting a train in a low pressure tube to reduce air resistance and firing it down like those old canisters they had in department stores, uh, vacuum tubes, obviously with humans in them. Supposedly very safe, people say couldn't have an accident, that sounds kind of ridiculous, but you can see why nothing could hit it from the outside, there's nothing to run into apart from I guess another train, um, but uh, could potentially travel from Los Angeles to San Francisco uh, in about a quarter of the time it takes to get there via conventional train, traveling at about 700 miles an hour. Musk claims this is the fifth kind of platform, if you like. I'm not quite sure whether that's true or not, but it certainly captured people's imagination. And even just thinking creatively about where do you put this thing, his proposal, and he's not proposing building it because he's too busy putting things in space and driving electric cars around, could run along existing interstate highways in the States or existing railways. So it deals with the problem that the HS2 has is, you know, how do you deal with all the infrastructure that's already there and existing land rights and people's lack of desire to engage in change. And I say this is someone who's had Crossrail being built underneath his house for the last five years. Um, sometimes you just have to put up with these things and the benefits are worthwhile. Although I wouldn't want to have lived in Camden in the 1850s when they were building that railway up through Primrose Hill. Um, so I think that's, this, is, this is great ambition, but unfortunately risk and conservatism uh, will probably hold back this kind of project. And we need to think about how to creatively present it in a way which engages people effectively in a way that Musk has done. So I want to talk about briefly about nodes. Now nodes sounds a bit kind of medical. All that means is interchanges, places where transport comes together with where you're, you're trying to go to or another form of transport you need to take. And this is, I think, one of the great problems of transport is, as I've indicated, you can get from one place to another directly very easily, but if you want to get onwards from there, it's often a real challenge. Now, this is Paddington Station, a rather beautiful picture of it, actually a modern picture. Um, this was designed and engineered by Isambard Kingdom Brunel, some people might have heard of him, uh, for the Great Western Railway. And this allowed someone travelling from London to travel to Bristol, Templemead Station, go to Bristol Harbourside and get on his SS Great Britain and sail to New York in 15 days. 15 days? That sounds quite long. It was a steamship, so it was pretty quick. So you could get from London to New York in about two weeks, which was pretty radical in 1847, I think it was. 
Um, so that's the kind of joined up thinking that we need. Bristol Temple Mead Station is a bit of a mess these days, but it was conceived as being a proper interchange to the sea, which obviously Bristol is most celebrated for, well, the sea, a big river called the Avon. Um, this is uh, Tanamera Station in Singapore. And this is built very recently. Singapore is a different kind of city to London, but it's all the underground subway stations were built in a way they integrated with the infrastructure. So you could take the subway to work, walk straight up into your office block, walk straight onto a bus that would take you the rest of your journey. And that's the kind of thinking, the creative thinking and lateral thinking that we need uh, to solve transport problems. Last Priestman Good Project. I do want to show you a video of this, but I don't have enough time, sadly. But if you search for moving platforms on Vimeo, uh, it's a two or three minute video. It's really worth watching, but you'll get, you'll get an idea of it. But essentially what they're trying to do is to address the issue of nodes such that you don't have to go through a node in a way to change transport. And they envisage a time when you could travel from Camden High Street to Berlin, uh, unter den Linden without getting off a form of transport or without stopping. And the idea is that you go on a local form of transport which docks alongside at the same speed as a faster form of transport. Uh, you can see them docking in the top right picture and then the bottom picture shows uh, a, 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 you know, a lock through from one to the other which stays open for a certain amount of time, you move to the other train, it closes and the faster train accelerates away, the other train goes back on its local loop. That's really inspired thinking. Difficult to do, risky, um, needs a lot of R&D, but definitely worth doing. That would be the video if I'm going to show it to you. And this is a really prosaic thing. Who's been on a canal boat recently? All right, you know, canals, you know, that was so 19th century, but you know, canals have made a comeback largely due to people spending their weekends digging the bicycles and dead animals out of them. Um, this is a lock on the Clyde, between the Clyde and the Firth, or the Clyde and the Firth canals. There used to be 11 locks here. Imagine going through 11 locks in a canal boat, trying to get some coal to Newcastle or Glasgow, I guess. Um, and they were essentially abandoned uh, best part of 100 years ago. And this project, the Falkirk Wheel, um, was designed, uh, I've got the reference here, I actually can't remember it, um, by um, Tony Kettle of RMJM, no longer a principal there, uh, Scottish architectural practice. And you, you kind of get the idea from looking at it. It lifts a canal boat hundreds of feet up in the air, out of one lot, out of one canal into another. And it's a kind of elegant, beautiful thing too. Uh, so that's the Falkirk wheel. And that's an interchange. It's obviously not an interchange used very much, but nevertheless, intelligent, creative problem solving at work. So the last area I want to talk about is communications and IT. And in a way, you could make an argument that why am I talking about transport and moving bits around, as Nicholas Necroponti pejoratively used to say, using, moving atoms around when you could be moving bits. I'm sure everybody here, teleconferences, you probably do screen sharing with your clients, you've probably got lots of clever ways of connecting to people who are not in the same space as you. And uh, that's all well and good, but actually often you find with uh, communications, it doesn't substitute for travel and moving to other places, it actually increases your desire to travel. You can see more places, contact more people, develop more of a relationship with them, and as a result of that, you end up wanting to meet them in person. Um, I'm not just talking about personal relationships, but professional relationships. And you know that doing business and shaking hands and looking someone in the eye always works better than having a Skype call that drops out after 20 minutes and just frustrates you further. So I just want to have a look at some of the solutions that communications and IT is bringing to, to transport. And some of these things you could say fit in other categories. I'm giving these examples because they're things which I think have qualitatively changed the form of transport. Who here has used a Barclays bike? Okay, well, almost about half the people. This is revived the bike in a really interesting way. And the bike, it's an old technology. I watched Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid set in 1902 the other day, and they were playing around with bikes, no doubt, from Coventry in the, in the West. This is the Barclays uh, web interface for the service and so on. You know, it's a cowboy technology, but through GPS, the internet, data transfer, mobile apps, uh, and all the rest of it, we've kind of revived 
cycling. It's not the future, but it's no longer the past, and I think that's an interesting use of ICT. This is a completely different, not a completely different example, but a different example of Zipcar, which is the successor to Streetcar, people might know, Wizgo, Camden Car Club, um, uh, Car2Go and so on, uh, and allows you to essentially car share uh, cars located around the city uh, and it works relatively well. It's a very interesting service design concept and by designing the service well it's made it usable for people. I think LiveWork people might know were involved in the original streetcar service design. Um, and you, know, you have all the convenience of a car without the hassle of owning it and some of the you know, there are some inconveniences of it but very few to be honest. Uh, so this is, could only happen with internet technology, GPS, in-car telematics that can tell Zipcar where your car is, how far it's driven and what state it's in and when it needs repairing because you've pranged it or whatever. Um, so that's, that's a significant innovation in using resources better. They're still cars, they're no different from a normal VW Golf. This is a really radical concept that was um, by Nia Sigal in this year's uh, RCA vehicle design show. And it's a car that kind of builds itself. Um, it arrives in a big package like a sort of totem with a 3D printer and you can actually see the 3D printer still in the back of it. And the 3D printer essentially you feed it and it spits out the parts of the car and then you assemble the car from those parts to the point at which you can drive the car to somewhere where you can get the other parts for it. So it's a really lovely concept, a car that arrives in a box and you drive it away on wheels. This is a project from the University of Washington by Toi Dong, who's a uh, uh, user experience researcher at the university and collaborated on a project about what are called heads-up displays in an avionics context uh, with some researchers from Industrial Design Engineering Department of the university and looked at how could you design an interface for a car that allowed a user to uh, safely and usably and pleasurably uh, get more features from the car and get more information from it. So everybody knows that odometers are generally badly designed and hidden behind the wheel and you can't really see what's going on and if you actually want to you know, control your music or you know, your kids or whatever it's very difficult to do. And this is using a concept from the military, from aviation, of putting the display in your line of sight. And it's a really interesting interaction design challenge and one we've got a lot of work to do on and one which risk and safety issues will no doubt impinge upon sooner than later. As you can see, it's, they're going to reuse lots of iPhone icons there, but yeah, that's fine. Okay, this is a different kind of in-car nav. This is the Tesla dashboard, which is the most gorgeous looking thing. Um, I guess it's giving you the kind of specs on the state of your car and so on. But this is what you can do when you've got a really expensive kind of BMW Mercedes class car uh, in terms of in-car information and telematics. Just a little nod to the whole smart cities thing. I find the whole smart cities discussion rather, uh, what should we say, all things to all women and men. But clearly information technology in the context of the city can allow us to use information about car movements, about breakdowns, about um, uh, where there are road jams and so on more intelligently so that we can ease the flow of traffic around the city so that people can know which routes to take um, so that uh, you can use the resources more efficiently and people may have seen a program called Route Masters on BBC4 recently which is all about TfL's operation centre trying to control the flow of traffic in London and information technology will if it's used right and designed right allow us to use the resources of the city much more efficiently. It's not the solution, uh, but it's going to be something which at least will help us in the interim. Um, so the, ne the next, uh, one of the final examples is kind of almost the other end of the spectrum in a way from smart cities, a, a company called Waze. Has anyone come across Waze, W-A-Z-E? They were acquired by Google recently, started by an internet entrepreneur called Diane Eisner. And they're trying to use kind of social networks as a way of gathering information about um, traffic jams, about accidents, about the best routes to get from one place to another and try and you know, use the social graph, to use that terrible term, to uh, effectively um, replace, no, supplement the sort of Garmin's and TomTom's and other wayfinding systems. Uh, to be honest, I think 
there were a lot of design challenges with it, not least trying to poke a button on your iPhone to say there's an accident without actually causing an accident is naturally a bit of a problem. Uh, but you know, I think it's got a lot of potential and that's a new application of ICT to again make travelling for us easier. This is another one for the, uh, the public transport user called City Mapper. Has anyone here used City Mapper? Oh, quite a lot. Wow, way to go. Don't they have the best updates when they post new versions to the uh, App Store? They're so funny. Um, no other software developers seem to have a sense of humour. So this takes a, a scenario, it takes a scenario approach to how we travel, which is a design approach to how we travel. It says, uh, get me somewhere. <clears throat> you can't actually see it on this screen, but get me somewhere. That's what we want to do. I don't care about the mode of transport initially. All right, we just want to know the options about how we get from one place to another. Uh, and this is going from Piccadilly Circus to, uh, to Curtin Road. You can take a, four, a tube and a 47 bus, you can take two tubes or two tubes, or you can choose just to have one mode of transport. And then you get this kind of interface, bus is leaving in four minutes from this stop, how do you get to the stop, walking directions and so on. So it's a beautifully designed application. And again, that kind of better use of information about what's going on helps us use resources more effectively and helps us be, quite frankly, less frustrated about the number four, which is one of the worst <coughs> bus routes in London, just in case anyone lives on it or is planning to move there. Um, okay, almost my final example, Halo. This is for the better endowed among us who can occasionally afford a taxi. Uh, they used to be a pain in the ass. Um, not just the drivers, not all the drivers by any means, but you can pinpoint where you want to be picked up from, where you want to go, have a card account, takes it payment from you directly, you can call the driver, get their phone number, know when they're arriving, and it just makes using taxis a kind of efficient pleasure again. It's not cheap, but it's much more efficient than it used to be. And that kind of intelligent use of ICT is something which we could only do today with smartphones, the internet, uh, intelligent data systems and so on. Um, so, uh, I mean, a lot of those examples could fit into another category I've been talking about, but I think all of them require intelligent, creative input, but they also require that we address some of the challenges that I think beset certainly the UK culturally at the moment. One of them is our refusal to invest properly in research and development and actually solve the kind of technical engineering design problems that need to be solved to make these kind of things work. Another is our unwillingness to uh, embrace risk and to do things which we know are risky, not to be reckless, but to you know, be prepared to take a risk. And the other is to be prepared to fail. Nobody wants to fail, particularly not in politics. Uh, and yet you never learn anything unless you're prepared to fail. Well, that's not quite true. You learn almost as much from failure as you do from, um, from success. Uh, arguably sometimes more in, in some ways. Um, I'm just going to pause this if I can. Um, we also need to uh, be more ambitious in how we think about things and what we're prepared to take on. Uh, a lot in the way that a lot of the examples I gave, the kind of Brunel's and Isagonis's and Whittles and so on of this world have done. Uh, and we need to be humanistic about how we do it. So I'm against the kind of solutions which tax us more for doing the thing we used to do, driving around London, discourage us from traveling by uh, making it more difficult to travel in some way or another, pretending in some way that being local is better than being global. You know, both are important for, for humans. Things which put humans at the center of transport and not just the environment, just pollution, just the roads, just the NIMBY neighbours. Uh, and I think all those things uh, can be improved with a creative approach to things, but we also need to think about the broader cultural challenges around the future of transport. So uh, I hope that was interesting and uh, I look forward to any questions you have. Thank you.